speak up and out. I can't speak, but I can speak up uh, to be heard without the microphone. Uh, one thing that's always interested me about history, not that I know a lot of history, uh, there's a character, and Dr. Young can help me here, I think it's an Apollon, Apollon. There's a character in a Faulkner novel who says the past isn't dead, it's not even past. And uh, as, as some of you know, I took some honor students to Italy to study the Italian Renaissance this summer. And two of the things we looked at is how the Roman Empire is still present in the Renaissance, it's still present in the present. The uh, Renaissance is still part of modern Italy, it's part of all of our lives. And of course, now we're really getting into speculation. But I mean, one of the things that I find interesting about looking at the past is that in a certain sense, because it still persists, it, it's self-knowledge that you gain. That's probably what it's the mm -hmm. <laughs> But you're right, it does just stop. And that's what um, makes Rome interesting. It doesn't stop. Um, we find out a little bit here, a little bit there, nothing important really anymore. Um, but it, it, it's part of, uh, like we said, it's part of uh, Italian life, uh, Renaissance life. It, it just keeps on going. And as a result, um, we uh, benefit, really, from learning more and more and more. And also learning, I think, learning not to trust it. Learning that this is not it. This is, this, this, this is not the Renaissance. This is not this. This is not that. Uh, but learning that uh, we have to kind of keep things under control. Keep our... Uh, keep our uh, energy under control um, and not gobble it up saying, this is what happened, this is what happened, because it's, it's hard to say what happened. Uh, it always will be hard to say what happened. It'll be harder to say what happened as time goes on and little bits and pieces are uh, uh, uncovered. I'm glad you took those kids to Italy, by the way, Craig. <laughs> Do you think that maybe the reason we didn't professionally pursue Roman history is because it was so much your love and you didn't want to make it work? And maybe it was just your passion and not your job? Yeah, yeah, definitely my passion and not my job. Uh, I thought about writing uh, stuff in Roman history every, every once in a while, but uh, there's nothing to say. <laughs> um, all the big facts, if you want to call them facts, have been revealed. So all, all you can do is quibble about interpretation. And I didn't want to do that. What I wanted to do and what I did do in my lectures, and some of you were in my classes there, is just make that one big point about um, you can't trust the sources in, in Roman history. And if you move on from there, you could say you can't trust sources anywhere. If that you that one big point changed my mind, so thank you. Okay, all right. Thank you. Okay. Well, at this time, we have another question. Okay. Uh, what lessons can be learned from the Roman history? Because you know you you heard about the rise and the fall of the Roman Empire, and there are some who associate the rise and the fall of the U.S. in world history. So, do you see any connection there, and do you see any uh, any link in terms of what happened to the Romans and what happened to us? Um, no. Uh. <laughs> America certainly has its problems, and you know, and God knows whether we'll overcome them or not. But um, in terms of making a parallel 
uh, with ancient Rome, Rome's problems were entirely different uh, than what we have in the United States today. And uh, what happened to Rome, uh, entirely different than what could possibly happen to the United States uh, today. Um, the Romans ran out of gas, I guess you could say, and became sterile. Uh, and, uh, a whole lot of different problems. Uh, we aren't, aren't going that direction. And also, what you have to remember is that Rome lasted 800 years. We've lasted, as a world power, maybe, what, 200? If we're lucky, 300? Although it doesn't look we're going to be lucky. Um, <laughs> Rome lasted for an incredibly uh, long period of time. Um, and for that reason, uh, had a whole different pile of problems that ultimately brought it down. And you can say Rome never really actually fell anyway. Uh, it declined, it changed. Uh, change is a better word. It changed dramatically uh, over, over the years. But it never really fell where you know, blam, on the ground with, with the face up. That never did happen to Rome. Uh, the Eastern Roman Empire, Rome split in half later, uh, lasted until 1452, just a few years before Columbus discovered America. Um, it lasted for an incredible uh, period of time, uh, which uh, a record that we uh, still uh, are going to have difficulty breaking, to say the least. So, uh, long story short, I'm saying, um, America does have problems, serious problems, but they won't bring us down the way uh, Roman problems brought Rome down. It would be a different, uh, different scenario. And I hope it doesn't happen. It would kind of like America. <laughs> I know that one of things that uh, our grandfather and your father said was, Educated beyond your intelligence? Yeah, said the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any way or any instance that brings to mind that you died being a captain of the dog house? Grandpa also said I never get a job. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I think he's right. He was, he was right in his own. Charles Guthrie way that uh, I think I think uh, I think too much about stuff. Uh, I just it'd be easier, life would be easier if I just kind of let that, let go, let go, see what happens. Well, say what me, you know. I, I I did worry a little bit too much about things, and I think that brings out my interest in in, in Rome, um, which I think you know you imply. Uh, He did make a good decision in moving to come to I think. But uh, outside of that, that's that's the way my dad was. And I just, you know, how to live with it. Just, I, I have to live with uh, the way all my family is. That's just the way people are. And that's the way he was, kind of a rough old guy. Uh, people work for a living. Uh, if you went to school, you weren't working. Therefore, you weren't contributing. Uh, that's how he saw it. Thank you, Sean. Oh, yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. I, I don't have a question. I just have something I would like to add. That, uh, I, I think is a particular talent that you have that never gets mentioned. And that is, I remember, because of your history, history, even as a young child, we would go to the movies and see their her. And I could say, Oh, look at that, isn't it wonderful? And you would be able to tell me what was going on in the rest of the world at the same time that event was taking place. Mm -hmm. And then you had that talent all the time, so that I, for the rest of my life, I would go to you 
to say, well, well, this is what's going on, what was going on here. And you always were able to tell me. And I just I think that that's something that everybody should know about. That is a real challenge. But I was going to not just walk in and suck the I have a question. Um, years ago, when, when I was in general studies on the same floor that you were in, and I advised students regularly, it was very common for students to come. And, you know, I, I guess I heard who all the good teachers were and who the, who the not so good teachers were. And you were one of the great teachers. I mean, they always, they always talked about how you made history interesting. What what is it about your storytelling? I mean, what's the, what, what is it about the way you choose to communicate with students that's so effective? You know, I don't tell people this much for obvious reasons. But um, who I use as my model is none of the teachers I had that they all sucked. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, it was uh, Richard Pryor. <laughs> if, if I use anybody as a model for teaching of making stuff interesting to the kids without, you know, grossing them out, which fire could do, uh, it was using him, using his sense of humor, uh, using the way he viewed the world, which was very, very in, in, uh, unique way. Uh, I think if that was... Any single thing, that was it. Uh, to Richard Pryor. He's done that. Could not have predicted that. <laughs>
I do think world is as important as geography. But you got to know where Texas is. <laughs> <laughs> if you're going to vote, come on. Uh, and so uh, both are important. And I hate to see one being sacrificed at the expense of the other. I don't, I don't know if um, uh, schools going the right or school districts are going the right way by doing that. It's just that they only have a limited number of classes, a limited number of classes that kids can take. You know, math, science, that's the emphasis now. Uh, and I don't blame them. Uh, you want students who can count. <laughs> it's good. It's, that's nice. Uh, but at the, at the expense of history, at the expense of, I think it's all important. I think it's all part of getting, a, getting an ed education, uh, a well-rounded education. And uh, math, science, important as it is, just as important as history and uh, geography, knowing where we came from, knowing where maybe we're going. Uh, it, it's all important. symbol of uh, justice, a symbol of um, uh, right, of morality, and so forth, against, pitted against, you know, the absolutely evil uh, comments. So that's where I think he comes in. He makes a good, he makes a good, uh, a good symbol. Excuse me, I didn't hear you all the way. Okay, sorry. Are you the kind of person who goes to the movie and yells at the screen saying that never happened, or it happened like this, or do you prefer to go home and play later? Roman history makes you a little cynical. Uh, <laughs> if I was a mathematician, it'd be a lot simpler. <laughs> Love those axioms. <laughs> yeah. um, it's, it's, it's made me a little cynical about um, the past. Not, um, not where I uh, despise the past or uh, hate it or think it's not true or, or it's all just a bunch of uh, junk. Um, it just made me wary, as, as I mentioned earlier when um, I was answering Matt's question. Um, it makes me wary about when somebody says, this happened, I, I want to know why, how, how do you know it happened? What else could have happened? Um, that's a slightly cynical, but still a happy guy. Thank you. You're welcome. I don't know what he was doing. <laughs> I think I think that was part of um, the voting system, oh, okay. where they were they Romans voted by what they call tribes. Um, they were organizing the tribes, and I think each tribe had a vote. 
they had a caucus kind of and uh, decided which way they were going to go, yes or no. And then once they decided, then they cast their yes ballot or no ballot. And that's what I think was going on there. They were, they were voting. And the second question is, what is the most important thing that you can do for yourself? For myself? Like for like as an individual, what is the most important thing that we can do for ourselves? Um, be awake. Um, <laughs> Be, a, be alert. Uh, don't believe everything you're told on uh, TV or on the radio or something like that. Think for yourself. Um, somebody tells you something, you go, wait a minute. Well, how do you know this? Uh, what other alternatives are there? That's it. To be true to yourself. I think it's the best thing you can do as, as, an, as an American. As a student, uh, as a student at Tarleton, is just think for yourself and don't take pat answers. at Tarleton, and of course, the faculty fellows, both present and past, we wish to thank you for your wonderful words of wisdom and wit, and congratulate you on a job well done as the inaugural speaker at the last lecture. Give me another heavy clap. <laughs> I've got to be honest to advise a lot of students. And this one young man in criminal justice was at my door one year for uh, advising. We were going through the classes, and he said, I gotta have this guy go through. I gotta have this guy go through. And we looked on the system. Class was full, so I worked with him, found another 15 hours. The next semester, he swung into my office and he said, you think I can get in Guthrie's class this, this semester? I said, I don't know. And we looked, it was full. He couldn't get in class. That young man came back four semesters before the upperclassmen had quit filling up your classes and he was able to take you. He jumped in my doorway that day and said, you know what? Guthrie's class is still open, and we put him in that semester, and I've heard that comment over and over again through the years. What a great teacher you are, and I want to thank you for what you've done for Charlton State University. I do think um, I've been one of the luckiest people in the world to have worked here for as long as I have, and for as meeting as many uh, students and faculty as I have. Um, I'll never forget it. It's been great. We are lucky to have you. Some people get asked to teach a class or chair a committee. Only one of a kind gets asked to write the centennial anniversary historical account of Charlton State University. Only one person gets asked to be the inaugural speaker for the last lecture. So your colleagues in the College of Liberal and Fine Arts wanted to get you a one of a kind gift to say thank you for who you are. Oh, okay. Your friends, <laughs> <laughs> your friends and your family love you and we love you. And we want to say thank you from the bottom of our hearts for being one of the best parts of the Charlton State University family. Thank you. Wow.
We were able to get you a gift that everybody could sign. It's going to take you a while to read They're in the College of Liberal Fine Arts. They yeah. That. <laughs> it's very nice, guys. I appreciate it.